today we're doing a special episode with Barney from Napalm Death. We are super excited. As I said uh, earlier, the new Napalm Death record is unbelievable. It's really amazing that uh, anyone can still bring it uh, so so many years later. And uh, not only is it heavy, but the guitar work is fantastic. The bass sound is great. The drumming is incredibly technical. And Barney uh, sounds like he has uh, only gotten better over the years. So um, let's see. All right. I think it's working. Hello. Holy shit, Hello. it's working. Yes. Yes. Fucking shit. I hate this fucking shit. <laughs> How have you been managing to get through this year so far? It's been quite an interesting one. Well, apart from the past couple of days, everything was going pretty swimmingly, you know, and trying to <laughs> log on to social media that I never use at all, ever. You know what I mean? It's like, it's all right, man, you know. Um, I mean, I've, I've just sort of been, um, I've just been lying low, to be honest. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, that's about it, really. I mean, I, I, I've... Um, obviously, for us, the album kind of came out um, not not that long ago, you know. So I've been I've been doing interviews. I've done about two hundred interviews up until now. I figured, why not use the time, you know, while I'm not going out and about to do, you know, the kind of live stuff with Napalm and that. So, um, so yeah. So I've been it's been interview central. It's only started to really slow down the last couple of weeks, you know. And and then this kind of Instagram like thing came up where she said, oh you can do some interviews on Instagram I was like okay you know just tell me what I need to do and that's fine you know <laughs> and this is a, like I say it's the second one I've done and to actually get onto it has been a complete disaster you know. <laughs> so, yeah no I appreciate yeah, no, I you appreciate um, uh, making this work out, this for, work us. out for us. Um, that's all good man. Let me the turn new you album the light on because it just looks really ball. strange. Just one second, man. Well, well, I got a lot of questions for you, and if you have to, if you have to jump off, uh, we totally understand. I'll try to just get no, into it. Don't, don't, you don't stress, man. My my sort of uh, health shortcomings are not your are not your problem, you know. So don't <laughs> don't worry, man. It's all fine. Let me let me ask you. I'm gonna I'm just gonna go into it because I like to use this show to go into people's history. I was gonna ask you about the early days, uh, you know, and sure. kind of bring us up to speed to where you're at today. What are your earliest memories of discovering aggressive music, entering your life? I know punk and Motorhead were big ones for you. Yeah, I mean, um, to be honest, when I was growing up, um, there was my dad that kind of exposed me to rock music, you know, the kind of Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin, and oh, and because I was from pretty much the exact, almost the exact district, got Black Sabbath, you know. It's, um, so... Um, so I mean that was really my like how I got introduced. But then I was I always and Shane always says the same thing. Shane the bass player, we were always looking for the next extreme, you know. Even at that point. So basically, when I I mean a lot of my friends from Birmingham were into seventies punk. I had a lot of friends that were either seventies punks or, or rockabillies, you know, and and that sort of thing. So so then I. You know, there I kind of got sucked into that world a little bit, but I was looking for something a bit more aggressive. So then I heard um, GBH, you know, also from Birmingham, leather bristle studs and acne, and that that to me just was like the thing that made me go, you know, I can, maybe I can do this one day. You know, it just sounded like um, a, a bunch of cavemen, just like banging out <laughs> something with dinosaur bones uh, you know that's how it sounded to me at the time you know 13 14 years old you know so that's really where it started for me alongside motorhead you know who were for me far above and beyond anything else you know absolutely, absolutely. yeah and, and being from birmingham area like sabbath and priest did that industrial landscape have a direct influence on um on the music do you think uh yeah i mean don't forget i wasn't in the formative years of napalm death i wasn't although i knew the guys and i was kind of hanging around you know i i, I wasn't but um i mean it i think sometimes 
I will say, I think there's a tendency to over-romanticise these things. You know, people say, oh, the, the sort of things like, oh, there must be something in the water. You know, it's mm. like, no, it's an industrial town. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, it just lends itself to that, you know, people looking for dark, aggressive, you know, kind of. So it's just that, really, you know. So, I mean, but it could have happened anywhere. You know, if it wasn't Birmingham, it could have been somewhere else. You know, and indeed, you know, places in the UK like Sheffield, Manchester, you know, northern, the more northern industrial towns have also had, of course, very um, productive music scenes, you know. And then going down to Bristol, in Bristol, Bristol, although not necessarily as much of an industrial town as Birmingham, had a, you know, very vibrant punk scene, you know, and alternative yeah. scene and stuff, so. For sure, yeah. I mean, I know obviously the UK um, had a, a, you know, the, the the punk scene here in New York was, you know, man, I, uh, I, I can't um, hear you at all. Uh, I was just, uh, oh, just saying, saying the, uh, the uh, you know, the punk uh, scene the obviously scene here in New York was a New big York. one. I'm, I'm, I know in the I UK, the UK uh, uh, not too uh, different. Not too so that had a so huge impact on you guys. But yeah, the I know you were not the original vocalist, but you were around back then. How did you? How did you join How the band and become friends with these guys and discover them? Uh, to be honest, um, I knew, I knew, first of all, I knew Mickey, uh, just uh, at Mickey and Nick, really, Nick Bullen, the, like the, the, the original, the first vocalist. I got to know them through, um, via The Mermaid, really, which was the kind of seminal uh, hardcore punk club of that particular um, generation of punk and hardcore in Birmingham um, and, and some other gigs as well outside of Birmingham where I've just kind of seen them around you know and, and, and Mickey the drummer you know so um, we just became friends and, and me and Mickey became quite close and we started to hang around together and then I sort of got to know Shane you know through Mickey so it was a bit of a chain you know so when the Scum album was being recorded um, I was kind of there or in the pub when they were finishing the sessions and they would come into Birmingham to the pub, basically. So, you know, I was kind of around and all that stuff was going on, you know. I didn't contribute, you know, as a, but I was just around in that general time. And I, I saw Napalm back then as a three-piece. And, yeah. and, you know, yeah. stepping outside of the band for a second, they were fucking incredible, you know, even at that point, you know. I would the band was always band was incredible. Always incredible. Right. And the, the, uh, the uh, that was such an was interesting, such a time. interesting time. Eureka Records, Eureka Records the early, the early uh, roster, roster with bands like, bands like uh, Morbid Angel, Angel Godflesh, Carcass, Bolt Thrower, Terrorizer. Terrorizer. Such an interesting, such time, interesting time, uh, time for extreme uh, music. For extreme music. I'm, I'm sure that you can sure share some stories about what that era must have been like. You know, the energy in the air. Yeah, it was it was it was a strange old time because. Like being around Napalm before the band, I was used to, um, I guess, certain kinds of settings for the band. And then when I joined, it seemed to change a little bit. You know, the, the venues start to get bigger. So it's a, it's a little strange in some in some respects, even for me. You know, um, I mean, I always I always stepped into the band under my own steam you know i didn't want to emulate anybody you, you know it was it was it was it was for me it was never about personalities it was always about you know specific individual personalities it was about the collective you know so i always wanted to contribute to that then when we did when we did the early tours um i mean i, I don't know it was a lot of it's really hazy at this point but um i mean it was I I um I didn't feel intimidated by it, but I I also I also kind of um, it was hard to comprehend, you know, um, how much of an effect the band was having, you know, on people. I um I didn't I didn't fully comprehend. I didn't fully understand, you know, um, as 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 a new member of No Farm Death and as the collective of No Farm Death, I think we were still. We were, it was almost like we'd started again, so we were kind of finding our feet a little bit again as a band, you know, and um, it, wasn't, it wasn't always easy, you know. I loved it, 
you know, because I was basically joined more or less my favourite band, so I was obviously completely, yeah, I was like a little kid, you know, I was really <laughs> excited, but but it, was, it wasn't easy, you know, um, I, I, I struggled with it for a little bit. I mean, one of the very early gigs with the band, I went on stage, like, really fucking drunk, you know, and like <laughs> Jesse was really fucking drunk as well, you know. And um, it was it was a little bit disastrous, you know. It was so bad, and I've told this story before, but um, it was so bad that Mickey, who didn't drink, you know, he was completely like straight, straight edge, you know. Mickey got so frustrated, he picked, he like kind of took one of his sticks and he just fucking flung it, you know. He lost his temper, <laughs> and it flew and it hit. Jesse was completely hammered, and it hit Jesse like right between the eyes, like straight on his forehead. <laughs> And, and I just remember looking across at Jesse and Jesse was so fucking hammered. He didn't even realize what had happened, you know, and he was like really <laughs> fucking cross-eyed, you know. And um, it just kind of taught me a lesson, you know, don't go on stage like that and play gigs, you know. I mean, it's funny, but there's also a serious side to it, you know. If people are going to pay money to come in to watch the band play, you know, you, you, you kind of owe them your best yeah, you know yeah. and you're not gonna do it while you're fucking drunk especially pay, playing this kind of music you know like fast and furious you know and all the rest of it yes there's an element of looseness to it and that there always should be the spontaneity but like being hammered is just it's, it's not conducive you know to like good uh, good results yeah i couldn't know, agree so. with you more, with you more. I mean, I'm a sober, yeah, sober uh, guy over here and a musician, and a musician, so I totally get so that. And and also, and if you also really if you dig really into the music, music, it's incredibly it's intricate, intricate, intricate and tight and, tight and, elaborate, and elaborate, and it's not, it's not um, as, um, as, you know, it's extreme, you know, it's extreme but it's but fucking, it's fucking, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, just uh, artistry just going into that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it does. It does have. It always has the spontaneity angle to it because if we didn't have that, it wouldn't be Napalm Death, in, in in my my humble opinion, you know. But, but yeah, it is intricate and it, yeah, and it just seems to come together, you know. Even when we're making albums, you know, there's no people sometimes ask me to explain the formula, but it's not like that, you know. We just kind of, it just kind of clicks together, you know, and um, it just works in the end. It always seems to. Um, you know, we always seem to achieve the end result that we didn't almost calculate, you know what I mean? If that makes any sense, mm -hmm. you know, Absolutely. we just kind of arrive where we, where we, where we arrive, you know, I suppose. Uh, Barney, Barney your, your voice your clearly voice is influenced by hardcore punk, punk as well as early metal. Who are some of your favorite vocalists? vocalists? Um, uh, well, I guess, um, Cal from Discharge, you know, obviously Colin from GBH. Um, um, what's his name from Siege? Uh, Kevin, um, the guy, uh, the singer that died. Um, um, the guy from Deep Wound. Um, Ian McKay, Tom Tom G Warrior. You know. Um, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, Michael Jara. You know. Um, Ian Curtis. You know. Um, ugh, the list, the list is endless, really. You know. Um, yeah, could go on and on and on, you know. That's a diverse, That's a diverse one. one. You, from, you know, Ian yeah, McKay and Ian Curtis to uh, yeah. Tanji Warrior, man. <laughs> yeah, they're all there, you know. And whilst whilst you might not always specifically when you're when you're making music, whilst you not might not always specifically think, oh, you know, that's Ian McKay. It's it's always there, you know. It's it's an it's a it's a um, it's a component element, if you like, you know. Absolutely. You know. Absolutely. And where did the where nickname did the Barney, Barney come from? Barney come from? Ah, so yeah, there's a very specific story to this. So, um, the band Doom, if anybody's familiar with them, also a Birmingham band, um, punk hardcore band. So, the drummer Stick was one of my oldest friends. You know, when I first started going to Birmingham and, and getting involved in the general scene, Stick was one of the people that I was really young, you know, 13, 14 years old. Stick was a little bit older than me, but you know, I was like a really kind of snot-nosed kid, you know, and, um, and you know, sometimes people are like, oh, this fucking little kid, you know, but Stick was one of the people who was, took me, you know, kind of took me under his wing and was like, you know, was really welcoming and friendly and accommodating, so he's become one of my really good friends, and so, um, so, 
obviously once you really started getting into heavy drinking back in those days so <laughs> um i had this habit of like destroying things but but not on purpose you know it was it just always seemed to happen if i'd had some drinks like i could lean on like say there was a heater on a wall or something i would just lean on it and it would just fall off the wall <laughs> you know with, with no force applied you know just, right. just fall right. off the wall so so barney rubble you know making <laughs> turning things to rubble basically that, that that's where it comes from so there's a there's a particular story actually and it was so um so the one night uh, me and stick um, we were in birmingham and we'd stayed till the last um the last orders for drinking and we were staying at sticks so we had to get the night bus you know so and the night buses only go up to a certain time in the week so so as we were going for the night bus um, we were walking under um, we call them an under like a subway an underpass you know okay. and we call them underpasses in the uk and so we saw the bus like from under the underground level basically and we're like shit you know so we started running and we i, I mean i was fucking drunk you know and i <laughs> I, I failed to, to negotiate the curve on the as the subway went round, and i just ran straight into the fucking wall and knocked myself oh out, my god, you know? my god. And, um, and, um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, we missed the bus, I, I think in the end, and we had to like, <laughs> kind of improvise, you know, and get him back to sticks. But it's, yeah, I mean, it's one of the things that happened. I'm sure everybody's got a story like that in their, you know, in their days when they first started going out, you know, to places and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah, it but was, they all yeah, fun times, time. you know, it was really fun times, you know, so. Absolutely. I love that story. Love that That's, story. Amazing. That's amazing. Do you remember do you what remember your first your shows first and tour experiences, experiences were like when you finally made it over to the US with the band? Yeah, well, it fucking hell, there was like some real keynote stuff, you know. So the very first gig we did was at CBGB's mm. with, um, with Prong um, just after Primitive Origins, the first Prong album, which is still like my favorite, you know what a fucking great album that is you know oh my god there's oh such god. a big such deal a big here in new york, york. I, I, I was yeah. just wearing my bag to differ shirt, shirt yesterday yeah sure sure but and, and another band called blind idiot god like an art um they were like an art rock band like really great band you know so um so um so we did that gig and fucking typical cbgb's like we we we, we, we got off the plane that afternoon completely jet lagged because we'd never really flown anywhere before and like we had to wait till three in the morning to go on stage you know oh my god, and, oh my god. man i was fucking i mean we were absolutely just destroyed you know but, but the thing is is that like blind idiot god um they they played this mega long set and we were like guys come on man like get off you know we need to play you know it's why it's still a reasonable time but Mickey just, again, you know, Mickey was very, Mickey's um, uh, temper, you know, could get the better of him. Sometimes he just got really pissed off and he just pulled the plug out. I'm blinded. He was going, eh, enough's enough. Sorry, man. Pulled the plug out completely on him. <laughs> and uh, it just got like very heated, you know, and I, I felt bad, you know, because even though it was getting really late, I, I, I didn't want to do that, you know, but Mickey just lost his mind, you know, completely. <laughs> And um, a Gitter, I know you had Mike on earlier. Gitter was there, he, you know. He saw the whole thing, you know. So he will, he will. Shout out to Mike Gitter, you Mike know. Gitter. But um, but yeah, it was you know fun time. So that was on the early gig, and then the next gig actually was quite different, you know. So um, so the band Immolation, like um, who were friends of ours, they set a gig up in Yonkers, a club called Streets, in, in like slightly up in New York, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah we went and did that so it was quite a significant difference between that and the cbs gig you know but you know all flavors to all people you know it was uh you know it was uh, something but yeah then then that was so we only did those two shows and then the first tour after that to be honest i can't really remember but i will say and this is this has been quite widely documented but those early days were in the us were great but also problematic you know because it was the time of like it was it was almost trendy in some circles to be like a like an Aryan brother you know so mm -hmm. we had real prop because we were obviously napalm has always had an anti-fascist sentiments you know 
So, but there was a time when it was, like I say, it was trendy to be a part of the machismo thing to be, uh, uh, to, to, to um, aspire to be a neo-Nazi, you know. I mean, I, I know that sounds like a contradiction in terms, you know, but, but that's, there was that element. And unfortunately, it was an element that was very disruptive, you know. Yeah. And so we had a, quite a few problems, you know, uh, that turned physical, you know, on the early, early gigs. And it was, it was miserable. You know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to sit here and romanticize it because there's nothing glory, you know, there's nothing glorifiable about that stuff, you know, but um, yeah, so it's problematic. So it was, you know, it, well, that was the negative side of it, but there was some great side to it too. It's some fucking great gigs, you know, back in the day. Yeah, yeah. Those early days in New York too, it's places like CBGB's, you never know what you're going to get, it wasn't as like professional as it is these days. Yeah, but that's all right, you know, I mean, there was also a lot of people that were, that didn't want to put up with that fucking stuff, you know, unfortunately the end result was it it got physical, you know, and I, that's not the way to deal with things, you know, I I used to be very like that, you know, very sort of, um, you know, very sort of vitriolic when it came to that stuff. But, you know, violence is not the answer. You know, it's it's, it's yeah. never the answer. You know, but uh, unfortunately, you know, that's what I, I couldn't agree with you more, man. More, man. I, I think that's what's amazing, what's about, amazing about extreme about music, music as an art form. Art form. You can get it all out, it all out in a really sure. cool really way without way fucking without beating the shit out of each other, other like on the street. You know? Street, you know? Yeah. Well, that's you know part of the thing with Napalm. I would suggest is it's a paradox. You know, it's um. It's extremely violent music, uh, sonically speaking, but the, the lyrics and the ideas are the complete antithesis to that, you know, yeah. so it's like two, two mixed things, you know. Let me ask you, uh, ask about, you about the creative, creative process, process a little bit, because I'd like to talk about that. What's, what's, what's the typical what's writing process, process like for you guys, and how has it developed, developed over the years? years? I mean, like I said, the like latest, said, record, latest is record is very... Uh, very uh, uh, elaborate, elaborate and, and technical and, and intricate. intricate so you know, kind of curious how that's curious developed over the years. Yeah, it's, it's never really changed to be honest. I mean, we are, we've been resolutely stuck to our like our, our processes on quite a few things in No Farm. You know, um, we we don't quite go into the rehearsal studio with a mini cassette recorder anymore. <laughs> it's gone a bit <laughs> beyond that. But but um, still, you know, um, in terms of process, like Shane will write. Um, on his own, you know, um, then he'll take some stuff and try and freeform it with Danny, you know, and he'll give me like, like MP3s of the stuff and I will, I will write from home, you know, I, I've always, I, I, in the early days we did a couple of collaborations, but not since then really, I mean, I, I really, my, my preferred writing um environment is at home um fucking blinds closed phone out of the wall you know i need complete isolation i really need to focus and concentrate you know i i could never i could never um although i i i take ideas constantly you know ideas for songs and lyrics i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to plug into the wall because my phone is starting to die um you were talking a little bit about the creative process and how it hasn't changed too much. I wanted to ask you about your voice a bit because uh, of how brutal it is. Does it, it, it come naturally for you? Do you have to do like throat maintenance and exercises to sing like that for so long? No, man. It's you know what? It just kind of comes out that way. I guess. I guess it must be an a a anatomical thing or something because. Um, you know, e every vocalist will will do what they need to do for themselves. <laughs> But my, my, my thing has always been, um, um, if you, like everything's interconnected. So I think if you, if you take care of yourself in general, your voice will follow, you know, uh, I, again, you know, this is my experience, you know, so, um, you know, that's all, that's all I can really, um, no, I, I, I totally understand that. I, it's just amazing that you're able to maintain for this uh, long. You know, it's, 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 it's impressive. And, and I was going to ask, too, like speaking of exercises, you do have quite a presence on stage. One of my buddies uh, compared you to John Joseph of the Pro Mags, who's pretty physical. Do you have like an exercise routine that you uh, stick with to stay fit and, uh, and stay energetic like that every night? Yeah, I do. I do. I mean, I, I, honestly... 
being on tour and stuff is hard to raise the um to raise your kind of um you know get out to 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 do a um a, 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 a regime you know what i mean but uh i just um yeah i'm generally pretty active um at home i do like endurance cycling and stuff um so that that kind of takes care that kind of takes care of that uh, but on the road I, I don't i must admit i don't really do anything too 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 hardcore you know um um, I just try and eat right, um, try and do get some exercise in, you know, and uh, just take it from there, really, you know. Eat the right foods. That That's a lot. That's a lot of it, you know, is to try and eat healthily, you know, not too much saturated fats, you know. And I'm, I'm sounding like a fucking dietitian now, you know, but it really is kind of like that a little bit, you know, sort of just try and, try and um, you know, kind of... Um, just try and take care of yourself generally, you know. Well, no, that's 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 totally uh, leading to my next question because I know you have been vegan or at least vegetarian for quite some time, and I was going to ask you what brought you to this lifestyle. Was it health, animal rights, both? You know, maybe you could talk about that a little bit, and then we'll get back into the uh, more music-related stuff. Sure. So, so where it all really started for me was so when I was um, around about 14 years old, um, my, um, my, my secondary school, which you would call, uh, I guess, a, a high school in the States, um, was, very, was very open and, you know, always the curriculum was, you know, very sort of, um, the boundaries were pushed, you know what I mean? So I actually saw, um, which was quite shocking, you know, back then, I saw a video of an abattoir. <laughs> A slaughterhouse you know they showed one and as soon as i saw it i was like i don't want to be part of this you know I, even at that age you know 13 four, 14 years old i was like i don't want to be part of this this is inhumane you know i, I and because that it, you know i start to get an understanding of what you know meat production was so you know i was basically no 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 i'm not doing this anymore so i went home and told my mum, you know and she was like huh what you know? <laughs> and I was like, no, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, so progressively, I stopped eating meat, and then on from there, sort of followed. Like, um, I started to have a, I started to understand about animal testing and you know animal products and not wearing leather anymore and all these various things. You know, so yeah, that just went on through my life, and I kind of never looked back really. You know, um, and 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 sort of in time. In time, I, I, you know, sort of went to veganism, you know, and um, and did, didn't haven't looked back from that, you know, you know, because and then, like people, people often ask, you know, well, you know, oh, one day you'll kind of, you know, you'll change, you know, you'll kind of get tired of it. I was like, no, because, not, you know, not to sound overly dramatic, but to me that would be a betrayal, you know, of the principles that I, the reason why I'm doing it in the first place, you know, so I. I wouldn't even consider that, you know, it's, uh, it's not something I would do, you know, and again, it's not, it's not for me necessarily, I'm almost irrelevant, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's the contribution to animal welfare, you know, and not supporting the meat industry or, you know, various things surrounding it, you know, the dairy industry at this point, so, um, so yeah. I'm with you, man. I'm, I'm actually a vegan myself. I just, uh, I find that really inspiring. I think that's really cool. And I uh, wanted to touch on that, especially for anyone that may not be aware of that um, area of your lifestyle. Um, to, to dive a little more deep into you, lyrically, your themes on the new album, are they a continuation of your usual themes highlighting injustices in the world? Or are they influenced by specific recent events in politics? Yeah, I mean that's that that's that's a general way of putting it, and and that's correct. But you know, Napalm Death is a very reactive band. You know, I, I've always, to me, to me, as the years have gone on, I've kind of come to the conclusion that if you make if you make generalised message albums, if you like. Um, if, if you really want the ideas to get across and, and people will deal with them as they see fit, um, you've got to be reactive about what's going on around 
in, in and around people's worlds. Because if you don't do that, they're not going to hook into things as, as successfully, I don't think. So a good way to illustrate that would be, so if someone were to now make another anti-war album, I mean, great, you know, I'm totally on board with that, you know, anti anti-militarization, you know, anti-militarism album. Yeah, of course I'm on board with that. But it's a bit too general, I think, at this point, bearing in mind there's been a million, you know, anti-war albums. I think you've got to you've got to connect very specifically. So, so the whole point about the new album was, I think it's fair to say in the last few years. I mean, we've always had marginalisation of people. You know, people have always been separated out into these little boxes in order to delegitimise them. You know, in order to marginalise them, whether it be, you know, immigrants as we know it. You know, these days, whether it be LGBTQ plus community which is very wide but i know that's kind of an accepted term you know um uh, whether it be romany gypsies you know it could could be anybody you know but the point is is that whilst that's always been there now it's come to the point where i think governments around the world are using that to solidify their own power you know so, so there's a there's an obvious one in, in the u.s you know what I mean? oh yeah yeah, well, yeah but there are yeah, but there are many others around the world, you know, in Europe even at this point, that kind of use these tactics. And, and the, real, the real problem with it, and the reason why I thought it was so urgent to cover this on the new album, was because it's, it's getting to the point in some places where the population's mindset is really being pulled along with this stuff, you know. And the, we have we saw in in Europe, especially in the 1930s, the, the the end result of this stuff. You know, very charismatic people used these ideas to, again, delegitimise people to where, in the end, it, it led to mass murder. You know, yeah, and yes. you know, so this is really, it's actually really urgent stuff. You know, so I I felt so all this was kind of coming to fruition at the point where we were considering starting to make the album. And I, you know, whilst I was thinking about, well, what am I going to do? What am I going to talk about? You know, it was just, I just felt that I had to do it. You know, I yeah. just felt like oh, we should do it. You know, so that's that's where I went. You know, it's like if you take the album before, you know, um, Apex Predator, that was directly as a result of the Rana Plaza um, factory collapse in Bangladesh, you know, that killed over a thousand workers you know inside a textile factory so it so in other words we're very reactive as a band you know we we reactive to current situations you know what do you uh i, I don't want to get off like too much of a tangent but what are your thoughts on the um just insanity going on with u.s politics as of uh recently with the election um, yeah, well, you know, I mean, it's it's a. Yeah, I mean, it's you know, it's, the weird thing is, is that um, I support the right not to vote as well. You know what I mean? Because I and and very often people say, oh no, you should encourage people to vote. Well, well, why? If people actually don't want to use their vote because they don't think the system's fit for purpose, then why should they? You know what I mean? So, I've always supported that. Um. Um. But. Um, I actually somebody somebody specifically had put quite a pointed question up about what do you think about anti fuzz like smashing up stores and stuff. You mm. know, um, I don't think people necessarily. Uh, Trump certainly doesn't understand what anti is or isn't. You know, because right. actually, anti as a whole movement doesn't exist. I don't know where people think there's this big homogenous group that's just anti -fa. I mean, it's just, it's, it's just not reality. You it's know just a I mean? philosophy. Yeah, it's, I mean, I, I, I know you, Europe has a strong history of Antifa presence, you know, because let's not forget what Antifa actually means. If it wasn't for Antifa, a lot of times in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s would have been overran by brown shirts on the streets in Europe, and it was Antifa that stood up and said no, you know what I mean? So I think people really need to adjust their understanding of that, you know? And, you know, 
I, I'm not, I'm not going to glorify violence. You know, I don't, I, as, as we spoke about earlier on, you know, I, 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 I don't think violence solves anything. But, you know, when you've got, like, almost like semi-militias going out on the streets with automatic rifles and stuff like that, you know, then what do people expect, you know? And, and I, I would also say that I find it really ironic that people talk about, get so aerated about property being destroyed, but it's like people are almost an afterthought, you know what I mean? People talk about property before people, and that's, that, that's very pointed to me because it, 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 it suggests that, um, you know, the, the, the sort of um, the welfare of people, the capacity for I was just I was just uh, giving somebody shit in the comments. Oh, yeah, you know, he's, I, I saw that, man. He, 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 he's entitled to his opinion, man. You know, that's, that's, that, that, that's up to him, you know. But, uh, oh, you know what? Yeah, there I am. You know what? I've actually just... Um, I've appeared on this now, on the, on the actual... It's an exciting back. one, Barney. <laughs> We're back. I'm back. What did I miss? Uh, no, we got people from all over the world watching, man. That's how much you're loved. You got people from yeah. all over the states. Oh, no, 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 no. You got people everywhere. Yeah. They're having a great time. It's all right. This is an exciting episode. So let's, let's move on a little people? bit. Because... I thought I heard you sparring with people as my phone died. Oh no! I was uh, I was just messing with people. I'm not I'm not I'm not really fucking with them too much. But uh, I, I do think that it's amazing that you're very outspoken about politics and your lyrics um, do touch on a lot of that kind of stuff. And, and it means something to me. And I think a lot of people out there, you know, I always felt like this was political music. You know. No worries. Let's ask you one quick question, man, uh, and and we'll see how far we can get. But. Do you guys have any special celebrations planned for the band's 40th anniversary? No, I mean we've we've never really been a celebration band, you know. All, all the all the all the milestones that have been and and come and gone whilst I've been in the band, we it was just never a thing for us, you know. We just we always we kind of thought in some way because we wanted to be a forward-looking band, you know. We we just we never we never did that. We never sort of put ourselves on a pedestal like that, you know, for anniversary stuff. And um, I mean, I, I certainly recognize the importance of some of the things, you know, but we, we, we were always forward looking rather than backwards looking, if that makes any sense, you know. It makes it absolute yeah. sense. Um, you know, I think that uh, you guys seem like the band that's always going to be there. And I hope that you uh, are here for another few decades with us, um, as long as you can do it. I have an idea, everybody. I think that we should try to do a part two, and I'm gonna reach out to to the band's um, record label and see if we could do that. We did get some really cool stories here, and um, I hope you guys enjoyed them. Uh, we we certainly did, and uh, I am going to put this entire part one of the interview up on the St. Vitus channel for anyone that wants to watch it in its entirety, and we're gonna try to get Barney back. Um, at a different time uh, for a part two. Thank you guys for watching. We really appreciate it. Barney, if you're out there, thank you. I think we're gonna have to, 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 to run because uh, I think your phone's experiencing some issues here. So we don't wanna keep uh, um, having uh, to put you through this, uh, this, this stress. Uh, I know you're not feeling well, but everybody from all over the world that tuned in, thank you so much. It really means the world to us and um, stay safe.